When you drive out of Ballycastle on the Cushendall Road, you will already have left Glen Tazy and Glen Shesk in your rear view mirror. And the next of the nine glens of Antrim you will encounter will be Glen Dunn. The road that descends towards the bottom of that glen and the village of Cushendon is now called, after the vanishing lake you have just passed, the Lacharema Road. Here somehow I'm always tempted to get out and walk for a spell, if only to remind myself that the territory I'm about to enter was at one time only accessible by Shanks Mare or by boat to cross the sea. And even then, safe passage to the misty vales and headlands up ahead was only ever granted courtesy of the omnipotent and capricious power that ruled this land, the weather. So I have to say that the November weather was in unusually benign mood when I arrived at my destination and entered Craiga Wood on the steeply sloping northern flank of the Glendon Valley. A stiff easterly breeze was the price we had to pay for the unrelenting sunshine which illuminated the autumnal glory of this quite remarkable deciduous woodland. Craiga Wood is beautiful in its own right, but it is not ancient woodland. It is man-made and is less than 200 years old. Here you will find beech trees, lime trees and occasional chestnuts. And although some native trees have moved in as vacancies occurred, it is a very different habitat to what you might expect to find in a glens of Antrim Nature Reserve. My companion today is the person who decided that it should become a nature reserve, open to and managed by the public. Her name is Katie English, and she is the owner of Craiga Wood. It came through my family. I think my great-great-uncle acquired it in about the mid-19th century, about 1850. Right. There's very little historical record about it, but I think what I have managed to find out is that it was a planted wood. Before the trees were ever here, it was farmland, and then it probably got abandoned during the famine and then was planted up, apparently by the bishops of Connor, but came into my family shortly after that. It was planted up, I think, to provide shelter for woodcock, for, uh, well, for shooting for shooting. Right, mm. right. I mean, it's hard to imagine how this could have been farmland in the I first know. place, isn't it? It would have been a pretty tough existence. Uh, apart, from the, apart from the actual steepness of the slope, mm. it's so rocky. Yeah. And of course, that's that's um, how it gets its name. Yes, the name Craig Wood. Craig, which means a, a, a rocky place. Rocky place, right, that's right. right. Yes. They've planted quite a lot of beech trees and close together, mm -hmm. and that means mm -hmm. they're kind of leggy and, and tall, isn't that, isn't, yes. isn't that the case? Yes. And you said you, we should never stand under. <laughs> you were told never to stand underneath a never beech tree. Never to camp under a beech tree. Or camp under a beech tree. Because when they are sort of stressed perhaps because of short resources you know there's been a drought in the summer yeah. they'll just economize by losing a limb they'll just drop a branch you'll get no warning about it right and there's another really interesting thing i found out about them recently which is that when they become fully mature they start releasing nutrients back into the ground to feed young trees and we'll probably see that further on in the wood but this autumn it was really evident to see the young beech canopy so it's like a new generation right. it's just grown up maybe to about six foot five foot or six foot and there was just this orange layer at about five foot and then the orange atop on yeah. above the, Beautiful. the autumn above right i mean the the appearance of things is clearly important to you, not just because you're a nature lover, but because you're, you're an artist as well, and you, and you paint. And, and uh, I've seen a few of your paintings, which, which I love, by the way. So Thank you. If you've any going cheap, let me know about it, will you, please? Uh, but yeah, the, the, the theme that I noticed in the few that I saw, bare branches, roots, mycelium, kind of fungus. Yes. Is that fair? Is that, uh, I think that's a very, very accurate observation, and I'm delighted to hear it, because it shows that actually you know, what I'm, my kind of little message is, is working, it's out there, which is just to do with the kind of warp and weft of nature and the fact that everything is woven together. And, you know, this wood is a perfect example of how not just the branches are woven together, but all the plants together create a unity that depend on each other. Right. And, you know, then we are all part of that too. So. 
So there's a sort of abstract thing that yes, yes. is evidenced by the natural world around yeah, us. Yeah. I mean, all the mosses and, and all the ferns, that's another big feature that you love about this place. Absolutely. The mosses are superb. They just cover everything with this wonderful velvet that holds the light. And at the moment, you can see it sort of like soaking up the light like a sponge and then bouncing it back. And it softens all of these rocky, mm -hmm. uh, hard edges, doesn't it? As and well? it's a very good indicator of a clean environment, too. Yes. Mosses are very, very vulnerable to pollution. Mm. So, you know, we are very blessed to have this kind of thermometer of how good the air here is. Yeah. Earlier, I described Craig of Wood as man-made, which is a poor description on reflection, because even though some still refer to it locally as the plantation, Nature, of course, has made this wood her own. And Katie, as I also said earlier, is anxious that it should be shared with anyone who appreciates it. Which is why it's now managed by the Causeway Coast and Glens Council as a nature reserve. They, in turn, have formed a partnership with the Glens Red Squirrel Group, who value this as an important habitat, not only for their squirrels, but also for the badgers, birds and bats who will always be assured of a home amid this 70 plus acres of deciduous woodland. But there are some other genuinely man-made features to be found in and around Craig of Wood that remind us of the relative youthfulness of this habitat because they harken back to a time before the wood itself was planted. If I had continued on the Lockerima Road which brought me here, it would have taken me across the Glendon Valley on one of the great engineering feats of the 19th century. The Glendon Viaduct, or the Big Bridge as they also call it here, dreamt up by a 26-year-old Englishman named Charles Lanyon in 1839. Nowadays, you could probably count the population of this glen on your fingers. Back in 1839, the population of Glendon numbered many hundreds of souls, many of them earning a livelihood from the Herculean task of erecting this colossus which straddled the Glendon River far below it. Each of these blocks of stone had to be quarried and laid further along the coast, transported by sea to the harbour at Cushendun, and then dragged up here by horse and cart. Further up the slope in Craiga Wood, Katie has brought me to the overgrown remains of an ancient structure which played a key role in the building of that mighty viaduct. This particular building, you can see, has been purposed as a forge because there are two forges. And, uh, so you would have had fires? Sorry you'd have had a fire, fire in yeah, there you'd and have a, fire a, bla a blacksmith, two blacksmiths working here, big hot fires. Right. There was a lot of work coming when they were building the viaduct up the glen, the big bridge as it's known. Yeah. And two local blacksmiths from further up the glen came down and worked just making sure the horses were shooed and I imagine doing the rims for cartwheels and things like that. So there was an enormous amount of work for several years yeah. between 1835 and 1839, I so think. So the 1830 this would have been mm. a real hive of industry, this, this The glen, population of the Glen would have been, uh, you know, just Hundreds inconceivable yeah, now. Yeah. So these, uh, you said originally these were probably predated that period. These would have been old bully huts or that, something like that. That's right. My mother always referred to them as the bully houses. The and houses. I was talking to somebody just this morning, he referred to them as the bully houses ah. too. Farmers would have come up here in the summer to graze the higher slopes of the yeah, yeah. of the hill. So this would have been a more substantial kind of, well, a couple of buildings in the past. It's yes. gone a bit to rack and ruin now, but yes. you, you're keen to keep them and... and, and, and I and think they hold a lot of history. You know, even something as kind of run down, as almost invisible as these wallsteads, yeah. you know, they tell a, to a story about all the industry and the population and the people who lived here. Aye. And when they go, that memory can easily yeah. go, you know, people stop talking about it yeah. if it's not written down somewhere. Yeah. Katie English is an artist who sees beyond the surface beauty of things and seeks to understand the landscape in both its natural and man-made aspects. Although by her own admission, she doesn't sound like someone who grew up in these parts, she would have spent her childhood summers and school holidays here and has clearly taken this glen to her heart. At the entrance to the wood, there's a mass rock and a souterrain. 
both relics of bygone centuries. And when Katie was a child, she tells me, every year on her birthday, she used to crawl into the souterrain and attempt to stand up in it. Definitely not something she would recommend anyone to do these days. But both these man-made structures, as well as the viaduct and the Bowley House, are reminders of earlier times when the population of Glendon was much greater than it is today. I'm heading higher up the Glen after this to meet a woman who lives in the townland of Drumfresky. Further up, beyond her homestead, there are no more people living in Glendon. When a young Glendon farmer named Ronan McCauley died suddenly in April 2016, it was of course a tragedy for his immediate family. But his loss was also felt most keenly by the close-knit Glens community who had lost another precious member of their sadly dwindling population. It had long been an aspiration of Ronan's to open up his beloved Glen for the benefit of walkers who would relish the challenge of the steep and rugged gradients of Glen Dunn. Five years on, and his family have been faithful to his wishes. Ronan's Way, with its five kilometres of mountain tracks, has been an instant success, a magnet for people seeking escape from the confines of Covid lockdown. Eileen McCauley is a respected local historian and an old friend. She also happens to be Ronan's aunt, and she's brought me down close to the starting point of Ronan's Way. We're standing on a footbridge overlooking the Glendon River, which has been wreaking havoc recently on the ford below us and on an old, well-known landmark hereabouts called the Taylor's Bush. Uh, there were various stories about it. One was it was called Taylor's Bush because uh, a journeyman tra tailor used to come, I'm not sure how frequently, but he would have showed his wares and people all from the Glen would have come and either bought what he had or left measurements for various trousers to be made or coats or whatever. Which was a travelling tailor? He was a travelling tailor. And he what, a set up a wee stall or something? Well, in today's terms it would be the same as setting right. up a stall. Mm -hmm. or the other story was that during the time of uh, Crumlin, uh, when he was uh, thinking of extensive plans for Cushion Dunn, he brought with him, uh, I suppose you would term them now as his labourers or workers. This is, this is Nicholas Crumlin, yes, the, that's the man, Nicholas the man Crumlin. who founded Newton he founded Crumlin. Newton Crumlin. Right. He built Newton Crumlin. And he had big plans for down here yes, as well. Yes, he had big plans for the Cushion Dunn. For, he built a, a rope works in Cushendon, which is now the yeah. Cushendon Hotel, and he had ideas of a big harbour. Uh, unfortunately, he went bankrupt. Right. But going back to the story of the Taylor's Bush, it was said that one of his workers, a man named Taylor, was supposed to have hung himself there. Oh. So there's two there's stories. There's two stories to explain the, the Taylor's name. Bush. I think yes. I prefer the one about the tailor, about the, the tailor, travelling yes. tailor. I think so. But the point of that story as well is that if, if he was able to set up uh, a stall there and get some trade, that's another sign that there must have been a sizable population of people around there. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yes. Right. You grew up here, Eileen, yourself. You were born, yes. born in Glendon and yeah. still living here. Has it changed even in your lifetime? Oh yes, really? very much so, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, when I was a child, most of these houses that you can see around us were all inhabited. Uh, they're all derelict now. So the population has certainly decreased beyond measure. Yeah. Uh, there's actually no inhabitants further up the Glen at all now. So you're the last house? I'm the, the last person living permanently here. I know from, from reading the history books, that at one stage, Glen Dunn alone, uh, and certainly during the time of the building of the big bridge, as you call it, the Glen Dunn Viaduct. The Viaduct. There was, there was hundreds of people living in it. Oh yes, there was indeed. From um, Craig Wood, which is way down, about a mile and a half or so, there was supposed to be, at one time, 300 people all up this valley. Across from us here, the other side of the Glen, 
is where we have this, it's become now quite famous, Ronan's Way Walk. That's and, right. I mean, that, that must attract some people who are masochists because it's one of the steepest rocks <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> you tell me people go right up over the top of, yes. the, of the hill there? Yes, and you will see them walking along just on the horizon there. We profiles of people. We profiles way. of people walking along the path goes along the top of the hill there, just more or less opposite us, and then you can go right away on out for uh, right to the march with the next glen. Well, I mean, that, I suppose I mean, that is the future for the glens in many respects. It's people coming to visit here to, to enjoy the, uh, being close to nature and enjoy the beauty of the scenery and so on. Uh, and really, I suppose that's, if there's any going to be any kind of employment or local economy, it has to be based on that kind of thing, would you agree? Oh, it's based on tourism now. Tourism is the big thing for the Glens, there's no doubt about it. With regard to tourism, Eileen has put her money where her mouth is. Because one of the houses that used to form part of a family clan where she grew up has now been completely refurbished and let as a holiday home. And in pre-COVID days, soon to return, she hopes, people from the continent were queuing up to rent it. Although Eileen spent much of her adult working life in Belfast, she returned home to Glendon some years ago and has expanded her considerable energies ever since in various aspects of community development here. Within a small population, everyone's opinion matters. And her firm adoption of tourism as the way to go is an important endorsement of the efforts of others. Which brings me to Cushion Dunn Old Church. And as far as anyone can tell me, it's always been referred to as such. Not presumably in the year 1840, when it was built as a place of worship for the local Church of Ireland congregation. There's a nice little possibly apocryphal story that Michael Harrison, the man credited with building it, did so partly in atonement for his father having brought ill luck on the family by using stone from a ruined medieval church in their previous home outside Bally Castle. Whether that's true or not, it was much appreciated, particularly by members of the dwindling gentry families who either lived or holidayed here in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It was deconsecrated in 2003 and was in danger of becoming a dilapidated shell until its cause was taken up by a local voluntary group called the Cushion Dunn Building Preservation Trust. After years of campaigning, lobbying and fundraising, followed by some careful refurbishment and repurposing, they are now able to present it to the world as the Old Church Centre. That's a great source of pride for Trust member William Colvin a self-confessed blue one who came to live in Cushion Dunn about 14 years ago and couldn't bear to see this former place of worship simply fade away. About four years prior to me coming down here to live, it was um, an empty cell of a building. Uh, the building itself was deconsecrated in 2003 and after that it was just going to be left to become a ruin. And if it was deconsecrated in 2003, that suggests it hadn't been used for a long time before that, no, would that be the case? that's right. The population had been dwindling down to, there was a few families really coming on a regular basis yeah. to church and it obviously wasn't feasible. The upkeep a, was a, getting to too keep much. The, exactly, yeah. Mm. Right, so, I mean, quite often what happens in an old church like that, that that's been sort of deconsecrated, abandoned, is that the roof is taken off because then it becomes not liable for rates or something yes, like that? Yes, apparently that's, that, that's, that's, that that's going to be the case where if the, the, when the roof becomes it's off, it's a ruin uh -huh. and uh -huh. nobody then really has any responsibility for it and to allow that to happen would just be simply a, a disgrace if that was to be allowed to happen. Well, especially with this roof. Absolutely. Because if we've been in and have a look around it and it is absolutely beautiful. It is. The inside it. of the ceiling looks really beautiful and as part of the restoration for it, really all it got was a a quick wipe and a rub and a clean. Beautiful wood finish for a start off. But the beams, there's a lovely kind of... It is, there's bit. a great arc in it. Does it remind you of, a, of the hold of a ship? Or it does, it does. And that does look like the bottom of a ship is right. And, uh, and maybe that was the inspiration for being so close to the sea here. We're only about 100 metres from the, the beach. What about the rest of it or the inside? The rest of the inside of it. We had uh, a new extension built onto the end, which you can see there, uh, which is now got uh, two bathrooms and an office and a kitchen space. Uh, which allows us to be more useful 
as a venue, yeah. you'll have maybe seen the coloured stained glass inside. There is one at the back. Yep. The back. It was a, formerly an external window. Uh, the extension that was here prior was only a single storey, so that was an external window. And it had you to built be. Around it, so we built speak? the new extension around it. We needed to raise the height of the ceiling, and the window was just too low. So we right. made it internal, which helps protect it in the long run as well. We opened in July last year, 2019, and from then it has been really a rocket ship of success. We have planned maybe one or two events in a month, and they were happening on a weekly basis, sometimes two in the same weekend. We've had a wedding in here, um, which was really nice to see the building back to what it would yeah. have housed in, it in its previous life. Um, community classes, workshops, dances. We've had concerts. The Ulster Orchestra had a quintet down here Seriously? in February. Nice, nice. And it sounded absolutely beautiful and to a packed house. Not surprisingly, the Old Church Centre project won the regional heat of the BBC's restoration series. And William Colvin himself, as chair of the Cushendon Building Preservation Trust, had the distinction in December 2020 of being one of the National Lottery's eight heritage heroes who had their image projected onto Stonehenge. That's William second from the left, by the way. In terms of uplifting the spirits of natives and visitors alike, Michael Harrison's atonement continues to bear fruit in Cushendon.